Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here. Good to be back after a short vacation there. As predicted, a lot went down with Tesla. The stock is up about 14% since I left. Pretty clearly all being driven by the opening up of pre-orders for Radio Flyers Model Y for Kids. Now this isn't battery powered like the Model S for Kids. It is just a ride-on vehicle. But Radio Flyer describes it as, quote, the superior Tesla experience in a ride-on car, end quote. But anyway, in all seriousness, I think the stock is up for a combination of many, many different reasons. I saw yesterday that the 8 or 9% increase was being largely attributed to the increased price target from Wedbush. Analyst Dan Ives had upped his price target from $1,800 per share to $1,900 per share. Personally, I don't think that was a big factor in the increase that we have seen. Tesla has largely been range-bound since the Q2 earnings report, and I think now that we have the stock split news that has helped free it from that range, and who knows what other impacts there have been over the last few weeks, from the options market, short interest, which we'll get another update on Tuesday of next week, maybe more or continued front running of possible S&P 500 inclusion or institutional investments. We've heard recently that SoftBank has taken a stake in Tesla. Remember, they had been one of the companies that had been potentially involved in possibly taking Tesla private a couple years back. But anyway, a mixture of those sorts of things is much more likely, in my opinion, to be contributing to the stock price increase that we have seen than an updated note from an analyst that has already been relatively bullish on Tesla. As far as the actual analyst updates go, I would say that the upgrades from Morgan Stanley and Bank of America last week on Friday would have had bigger impacts on the stock. Those were actually ratings upgrades, so the equivalent from a sell to a neutral rating. And I recently learned that in some cases, financial advisors at banks like that cannot actually recommend a stock that that bank has a sell rating on. Obviously, they could still buy that stock at their client's request, but they can't actually recommend it if the bank has that sell rating. So now, with these upgrades to neutral, these financial advisors can actually recommend the stock to their customers. Bank of America, for example, which operates the Bank of America and Merrill Lynch brands, has more than 25,000 financial advisors, and you can bet that some of them were on the phone on Monday talking to their clients trying to get them to buy Tesla stock. I know that for sure for Bank of America because one of our listeners is a financial advisor for them, and that's how I'm aware of this information. Anyway, there's always things like that that may not be apparent at the surface level that are going to drive the stock that you're not going to find in headlines. All right, getting into more of the Tesla news from the last few days, then we're going to stay pretty high level here. I am still catching up, but we did have an Elon tweet storm on Friday, of course, talking a lot about Tesla's technology with Project Dojo and Autopilot and a couple other interesting topics as well. So we'll start off with Dojo. Elon kicked this off with another recruiting message saying, quote, Tesla is developing a neural network training computer called Dojo to process truly vast amounts of video data. It's a beast. Please consider joining our AI or computer slash chip teams if this sounds interesting, end quote. If you need a refresher on what Project Dojo is for Tesla, Viv on Twitter put it well by saying, quote, Dojo is used to increase training speed and enable self-supervised learning. This is at server side, so no upgrades required on individual cars, if I recall correctly, end quote. Elon confirmed that saying exactly, and also adding some technical details by describing Dojo as, quote, a truly useful exaflop at de facto FP32, end quote. So if you're unfamiliar, FP32 just represents the number of significant digits being used by a computer in its calculating process. A computer uses a combination of significant digits and exponents to calculate things. So FP32 just means that the numbers being used in those calculations are stored in 32 bits of memory, versus something like FP16, which would only use 16 bits of memory to store the numbers used in its calculations, meaning it can only use about half the number of significant digits, leading to less precise calculations. So FP32 would give you more precision, but FP16 would theoretically handle the calculations faster because it is using less memory. For that reason, a lot of neural network programming is done on FP16, but with Tesla, it looks like they're opting here for FP32 with Dojo for that increased precision, but then Elon does also tell us about the speed of calculation when he says exaflop. Flop refers to floating point operations per second, and then exa is just a prefix similar to giga, which we'd always talk about with gigawatt hours. Giga represents 1 billion, so 1 gigawatt hour would be 1 billion watt hours. Similarly with flops, 1 gigaflop would be 1 billion operations per second. An exaflop is that times a billion. So 1 exaflop is a billion billions of operations per second. For comparison's sake, top500.org has put together for the last 25 plus years a list of the top 500 supercomputers in the world. Right now, the highest performance computer is the Fugaku system out of Japan, co-developed by Fujitsu and Riken. And in benchmark testing, it turned in a performance result of 415 petaflops, which would equate to 0.415 exaflops. 
Again, Elon saying that Dojo will be a truly useful exaflop, meaning it could perform better in benchmark testing or in some specific use cases, but for Tesla's use case, it will perform around that exaflop level, making it one of the fastest supercomputers in the world. Probably not the fastest, there will be advancement between now and when Tesla's is operational, and I've also been unsuccessful in figuring out the details of exactly how these benchmark tests for supercomputers are performed. They're compared on a test called HPL, or High Performance LinPack, but I'm not sure how those test results factor in the added precision from 64-bit versus 32-bit versus 16-bit, for example. So I'm not sure how Tesla's exaflop would compare to the test results here. If anybody has more experience on that, please let me know in the comments, but the top 500 list does add to these test results, again, of 415 petaflops for the top computer by saying, quote, in single or further reduced precision, which are often used in machine learning and AI applications, Fugaku's peak performance is over 1,000 petaflops or one exaflop, end quote. So single precision, which is mentioned in there, generally refers to FP32. So it sounds like Tesla would be targeting the performance roughly of the current best supercomputer in the world. But of course, Tesla will be optimizing that performance for exactly what they need it to do. I think this is an aspect of Tesla that has been underappreciated, and even with this tweet from Elon, will likely continue to be unrecognized and underappreciated, but is worth remembering when people try to argue that Tesla is not a technology company. I think you can point them right back to that tweet. As for the exact timeline, Elon said on Twitter that Dojo is still being built, that it's maybe a year or so away from version 1.0. Moving on from Dojo, Elon also had a few tweets on Autopilot. Everyday astronaut Tim Dodd asked Elon when the next major Autopilot release would be, and Elon said, quote, The FSD improvement will come as a quantum leap because it's a fundamental architectural rewrite, not an incremental tweak. I drive the bleeding edge alpha build in my car personally, almost at zero interventions between work and home, limited public release in six to ten weeks, end quote. We've heard Elon express those feelings a few times now, but that timeline is new. Six weeks from that tweet would be Friday, September 25th. Ten weeks would be October 23rd. It is worth noting that timelines similar to this, even related to autopilot features like summon or reverse summon, in some cases, even this close in, have slipped by months or even a year or more. So in general, while I believe Elon and Tesla have gotten better at communicating these timelines, Specifically with Autopilot, they should be taken with a large degree of error. Elon also mentions limited public release here. That could mean limited to a region, like the US for example, or limited to a tighter group of people, maybe the early access beta program. Either way, exciting to see the continued confidence and hopefully ever more closely approaching release date. A couple more interesting tweets here to go through. Elon replied to a Tesla Roddy article mentioning the low stock on power walls. We had talked about that last week. Elon said, quote, Tesla team is working hard on increasing power wall production, end quote. Not much to add to that, but it does seem to confirm the production constraint. Personally, for battery day, I'm super excited to hear more about how that's going to impact the energy business. Understandably, a lot of the focus has been around how it's going to impact vehicles, but I think it'll be just as impactful for energy. Next, Elon gave an update on two-factor authentication for accessing vehicles. He said, sorry, it's been embarrassingly late, but it is going through final validation currently. And then a project that a lot of people are really excited about and have speculated about is an electric vertical takeoff and landing supersonic plane from Tesla. Somebody asked about that and Elon said, quote, I want to do an electric VTOL supersonic so bad, but my brain will overload, end quote. Elon has made similar comments in the past, though I believe at times he has mentioned 400 watt hours per kilogram needed in terms of energy density to make a electric VTOL make sense. I believe the Model 3 batteries are right around 250 watt hours per kilogram, but there are batteries available that are more energy dense. So this is, I believe, another example of Tesla not being limited for ideas, really just being limited in terms of the bandwidth for implementing those ideas. This idea is definitely not going away, so hopefully at some point it'll make sense for Tesla to allocate the resources for it. All right, last thing I want to talk about for today is a report from Electric on an article from the China Times about Tesla's chip production for their full self-driving hardware. I don't want to go into as much detail as we did on Dojo on this one, but the China Times says that according to some industry news, Tesla is working with TSMC, a Taiwanese semiconductor manufacturing company, to support advanced driving assistance systems, leading to speculation from Electric that this would be for a hardware 4.0 chip from Tesla, though the China Times article does also mention in-car entertainment as something that may be powered by this chip, which would be different than how Hardware 3 operates. But regardless, really all I wanted to say about this topic, if it is for Hardware 4, 
this should not be surprising at all. I've seen some people on Twitter and elsewhere questioning why Tesla would need a hardware 4.0 if hardware 3 is supposed to be capable of full self-driving. But a hardware 4 has always been in the works. Elon mentioned it specifically at Autonomy Day last year when they really unveiled hardware 3. He said at the time, quote, it's maybe worth pointing out that we finished this design maybe one and a half, two years ago and began the design of the next generation. We're not talking about the next generation today, but we're about halfway through it. All the things that are obvious for the next generation chip we're doing, end quote. A few of those obvious things would be increasing the calculations per second, maybe lowering the costs, and I would guess that lowering the power requirements for the chip to operate would be a big priority as well. So the development of this chip doesn't necessarily mean that Tesla can't get full self-driving working on hardware 3, just that it might be incrementally better, even if that's just from a cost for performance perspective on next generation technology. It would be pretty silly to assume that Tesla isn't going to continue to iterate and advance and optimize their hardware, and I would assume that if this indicates that they're wrapped up with the design for hardware 4, they've probably already started designing hardware 5. Anyway, whatever this chip ends up being, the timeline suggested would be for a production test run in Q4 of 2020, and then mass production in Q4 of 2021. One final note for today, just a quick congratulations for SpaceX on the successful completion of their 100th launch today successfully deploying 58 new Starlink satellites and capping that off with a catch of a fairing half right into the net of SpaceX's ship, Miss Tree. This launch was also a record for orbital spaceflight reusability. It was the sixth launch and also sixth landing for this particular Falcon 9 booster, both records. So congratulations on that, and that will wrap it up for today. As always, thank you for listening. Happy to be back on the podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and sign up for notifications. Make sure you're following me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast, and I'll see you tomorrow for the Wednesday, August 19th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.